rebel with the cause. And that's because I like to challenge the status quo um, and push the boundaries of the industry. I'm inquisitive and, and like to ask questions. I've worked with a, a many, many organizations in both the service management and the organizational change management space. Uh, so my background was primarily IT service management back in the 90s, and I still do a lot of work in that space. But just over a decade ago, um, I moved into the organizational change management states as area, which is a passion of mine of helping organizations with the people side of change. So I've written five books on organizational change, workforce resilience and leadership. Four of them are on that on that screen um, and also an international keynote speaker. So as an organizational change management consultant, when I'm going into organizations or talking to organizations, I'm observing firsthand the changes in the way we are working is having on our leadership. The future of work is the future of leadership and the future of work is hybrid. And that means we need a fundamental shift in the way we lead. So I'm driven to make a difference and that's to enable today's and tomorrow's leaders to be effective leaders of hybrid teams. One where there's a mix of people that may be in an office, may be remote, may be a combination, there's many various models. It's all about employee flexibility. Gone is the office as the only location and gone is nine to five as the working day. So as I said, the future of work is hybrid. There's still a lot of debate going on about what that looks like. Um, there's a lot of people still with their heads in the sand, want to ignore it and hope it'll go away, but it's not going to. Employees have had a taste of flexibility and autonomy and they want to keep it. And all the research and the studies support that. Regardless of the hybrid model, leadership is facing a challenge like never before. Whilst leaders in multinational organisations, and some of you may fall into that category, have been leading hybrid teams and remote workers for many years. For most of our leaders, the reality is for most of our leaders, they've never done this before. This is uncharted territory. And the research is revealing that leaders are not ready. So what does that look like for leadership? So as I said, leaders are not ready, and that is a generalisation I appreciate. But from everything that every people I'm talking to um, and the, thing, the research and the studies that I'm reading, that is the state of affairs. And there was research by a company called Terminal last year, and they revealed that 77% of leaders that they surveyed or um, interviewed had never managed a fully remote team before. And 89% had never managed a hybrid team, a mix of both in-person and remote ever before. And that is admitting that, well, if they realize that leadership is different when you're leading a hybrid team, because it's fundamentally different in many ways, which is what we're going to explore, um, this is a challenge. And it's not that our leaders don't want to lead a high performing hybrid team and be an effective and a great leader, but help is needed. This is a fun, unforeseen and complex and multifaceted situation. As I said, it's uncharted. We haven't got a rule book or a standard operating procedure we can refer to. This is learning as we go for many leaders. And we need leadership development that's not been considered before to help leaders effectively lead the hybrid team. And I want to share with you one of the reasons I believe leaders are not ready. And this was evident that by behavior that was exhibited at the start of 2020 with the onset of the pandemic. And, you know, micromanagement continues to be pervasive even though it should be more difficult or just totally not in the leadership anymore. And she certainly should not be conducted in a virtual environment, but the magnitude of the situation was evident from research by a company called Top 10 VPN. 
and they showed the increase in demand for employee surveillance software highlighted the inability for leaders to act as good leaders in this new world of work. In April 2020, a month or so after the onset of the pandemic, the global demand for employee surveillance software went up by 87% compared to the previous year. This was a knee-jerk reaction, and I shouldn't call them leaders, by managers saying, if I can't see them, I don't know how to manage them. And that is a fundamental mindset shift if we want those people to be leaders of teams. In the following May 2020, it went up by 71% compared to the same time the previous year. So clearly managers you know, don't think they can lead um, a distributed team, a hybrid team, without a big brother approach. So what's, what are they looking at? They're looking at keystroke recording, location tracking, taking screenshots, video recording, in, internet usage, browsing the history, email monitoring, you name it, the list goes on. And what is really scary is that employees are responding. They're going, well, okay, if you're going to monitor keyboard strokes and interpret that as me being productive, I'm going to make it look like I am hitting the keyboard. So we have employees now putting paper clips into the insert key. We've got employees putting weights on the keyboard to make it look like they're, they're working. People are putting a mouse, if they're using a mouse, on an analog clock because the second hand imitates the mouse moving. Now, this is really scary that we've got you know, highly intelligent knowledge workers reacting in this way because the way their managers are reacting. And whereas with our um, communication um, applications like you know, Teams and Skype, the status was to inform someone who wanted to know whether it was a good time to talk to you or um, whether you were going to be available for a conversation. So they'd look with you know, away from the desk in a meeting. Well, now away from the desk has been interpreted. Why aren't you at your desk? Why aren't you at your keyboard? You can't be working if you're not. So employees, again, are making sure that the green light is always on. Um, on their status. So this is just Orwellian behavior by managers. And there is no excuse for management in, in that way. Um, and this equates to, you know, a bad boss or a manager believing that if they can see an employee at a desk in the office, that means that they're productive. You know that's a load of rubbish, and so do I. Yeah. So Whilst there's many factors we have to think about in our new um, uh, way of working, such as the technology, office space, policies, logistics, uh, security, technology, it's leadership that's going to be paramount that we need to address and change. So it's going to need a fundamental mindset shift. The leaders that think they can just carry on as they were before are having a big wake up call. And we're not going to go back to the way it was before. You know, the genie is out of the bottle and the bottle's been broken. The future of work is hybrid. Um, and again, there's many, many models, um, but it's going to make a big leadership shift. And the lead organisations that are not enable their leaders to make this change are going to suffer and find themselves left behind as the competition thrives. So this is my value model for enabling leadership, um, increasing the leadership capability to lead the hybrid team. So on the left, employee experience, leadership capability in the middle and reflected in team performance. Then, as I said, most leaders are tackling the challenge of leading a hybrid team for the first time. And the reality is they're not ready and they're floundering. Yes, they are striving to do the right thing, but they're struggling because this is new. As I say, there's no textbook. They go, this is how I lead my hybrid team and this is how I make the transition. So that's while the leaders are floundering and striving, that's leading to, leading to employee consternation and confusion. And they're saying, 
was our leader and our clear direction. And employees need connection and cohesion regardless of where they're located. They need collaboration not only across the team, but cross functional functions and cross locations as well. So leaders need a program of learning, education and coaching, tools and resources so that they and can that and leveraging best practice. Um, so they're not going it alone, so they can flourish in this new world of work. Effective leaders who can lead the high performing hybrid team. And when that happens, when our leaders are flourishing in this environment rather than struggling, this means that team performance is high. And that means that when productivity increases, so does profitability. So there's a substantial return on investment in um, investing in leadership development. So just take a few moments to think where your organization sits on that model at the moment. And then have a thought about where you would like it to be. This is the what I call the contrast uh, model. So when leaders become more effective at leading the hybrid team, they stop being detached from their employees. Some leaders are detached because they can't see them. They stop being attached and they're connected regardless of where their team and employees are located. They stop being apathetic and oh, they'll cope, they'll manage, and they lead with real empathy. And rather being indifferent to employee situations, and every employee situation is different to the others, rather than being indifferent because it all gets too hard, they lead with compassion. And they get rid of proximity bias. And this is a real bias that now exists where people give put higher value on the work done by someone they can physically, they are physically co-located with than someone that's remote. And it's a bias that leaders have to overcome so that they are leading with inclusivity and equity. Everybody has to be on a level playing field regardless of their location. They have to move from being invisible to staff and put in protocols to make sure that people know when they're available and when they're accessible. And as we've seen, they have to stop monitoring hours at a keyboard and measure the right things in the right way. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment as well. That's a big fundamental shift. Moving from being rigid in their thinking, this is the way we've always done it, to being more adaptable. And as this is a journey that leaders are going to go on with their teams, then it's a, it's a learning journey. So there will be adaptation along the way as we, as we learn and correct our, um, correct our path. And moving out of a comfort zone into a learning zone. This is leaders with a growth mindset say, yeah, I'm going to be out of my comfort zone, but this is about learning and this is about growth. And this is about not only for me, but also for the team. So this is um, the model I use to help organizations increase the awareness for a different um, type of leadership. Um, and I'm, with the 45 minutes that I've got, what's left of it, um, I'm obviously not going to go through every one of these um, aspects on this model. But over at my website, if you do want to know more about some of the other the, um, aspects of this model, there are blogs and posts on, on all of these. So karenferris.com is the website. Um, and these competencies are the ones that I believe are a step above what good leadership should already look like. So if you think about um, characteristics of good leaders, such as providing and receiving um, feedback, having emotional intelligence, um, courage and respect, they are not on this model because I've taken them as a given. These are the aspects I believe need to be uplifted or introduced if they're not already there for leaders 
to effectively lead the hybrid team. So let's look at some of these so you get an idea of um, the way, way I'm thinking. So we start in the middle with forming, storming, norming, performing. Now, many of you may have heard that before, and it's the Tuckman stages of team development. And Tuckman introduced this back in 1965, but it's still in wide use now. And, and I propose that it's a good diagnostic framework for forming hybrid teams. So forming, this is about whether, whether it's a new team or a team operating in a new way and finding their way. So forming is when there's uncertainty. We're not really sure what's going on. We're looking for guidance. Storming is when there's conflict and there's, there's pushing for elbow room, you know, virtual elbow room and resistance to influence from the group. Norming is when the team starts to get more cohesion. And then performing is when the concern for the team is getting the job done. So let's talk, take a look at what that means for the leader of a hybrid team. So for forming, the big consideration here, for the leader of a hybrid team, especially if they've used this model before, is that this process is going to take longer. When you've got some people that may be in an office, some people may be working from home, some people may be working in a hub, some people may be working in a workspace, in a library, in a cafe. And the leader's role is to bring them together and start forming them into a team. And that is going to be harder and take longer, which doesn't mean it shouldn't be done, but for hybrid teams. So leaders have to be absolutely clear about roles and responsibilities. Provide the team with clear goals and a shared sense of purpose. And again, it sounds, well, that sounds obvious. We should do that anyway. Yeah, but it's easier to see when someone's co-located or to sense that they probably haven't actually understood what their responsibility is. When they're working remotely, you might not be get that sense. So you have to make sure it's absolutely clear and that everybody has clarity. And think about ways to form the team. Can you get the team face to face for a period of time? How can you use some of the team building um, spontaneous connection applications and platforms to help form the team? And it's about fostering trust, which starts with respect and empathy. And empathy is an easy word to say, but often hard to do. So you need to make sure you're always asking to make sure that people have understanding. Storming, as I've mentioned, it's when there's conflict. And this is where there's false harmony because people are keeping things to themselves. They're not quite sure whether they're safe to share things yet. And any dissent um, or disagreement can be buried because they're not feeling safe to challenge or question yet. So as a leader, you need to uncover that conflict, take it out of the darkness and bring it into the light so that you can deal with it and manage it. And that requires leaders to create, maintain and sustain an environment of psychological safety where everybody feels free to question, challenge, share ideas, without any fear of repercussion or reprisal. And that can be a big shift for many leaders. And it can be easier to sense conflict when you're co-located with somebody or with the team. When they're distributed, it might be harder to pick up. So leaders need to be a, a more cleverer watchdog than they've ever been. Norming is when the team are now getting to know each other, Conflict has been surfaced. It's not the dominant um, characteristic of the team. And this is where leaders need to not only capture, as they might have done previously, but also document the team agreements. How are we going to handle conflict? So that everybody, again, regardless of location, knows what to expect. Um, determine you know, team member preferences 
do maybe some behavioural assessments, do some profiling. It's easier to sense how a person likes to be likes to be communicated with or presented with an idea when you're sitting in a desk next to them. You can tell by someone's desk if they're a detail person or a big picture person. Um, you know, if they've got lots and lots of graphs and things on the walls and they're a detail person. If it's a really clear desk and it's just big, it's the pictures, they're a big picture person. That again is harder to tell when you're not co-located. So try and capture preferences and share them amongst the team. And then performing, this is where there's high levels of autonomy. And to get here, leaders need to really empower employees and then get out of the way. It's not management by abdication, but it's also no place for micromanagement and no place for surveillance. Micromanagement and surveillance just screams, I do not trust you. And that is no way to build a team. So we need to, at this point, what leaders need to do is keep a close watch that the team doesn't start to slip back down to the previous stages. Again, easier to sense slippage happening when you're co-located as when it's a distributed team. So let's take a look at objectives and measuring performance. And this could be one of the biggest mindset shifts for leaders as we new, move into this new way of work. And I'm just checking there's a Q&A question. Okay, I'll come back that to the and I'll come back to that at the end if that's okay. Um, let me just close that down. So objectives and measuring performance. Now, great leaders have been doing this um, or already, but leaders moving into measuring a hybrid hybrid team are having to rethink this for the first time. So. Objectives should be motivational. You know, some, some employees working remotely may find it harder to motivate themselves. Um, so objectives should energize behavior, provide absolutely clear direction and give employees a challenge. So I suggest learning objectives as opposed to performance objectives. So we'll give you an example. A performance objective could be John, I want you to run three town hall meetings to reach over 700 employees in the next quarter. Change that to a learning objective is, John, I want you to find a way to reach 700 employees in the next quarter. It's telling John why we need to do something, but not how. Yeah, we're not already, so John can now explore, innovate, be creative, um, and be energized as a result. Clarity is absolutely king. There is no room for ambiguity. If you set um, an objective without clear expectations that you know your employee understands, then as Brené Brown said, you know, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. It can be a disaster. Do not assume your employee knows exactly what you expect get them to play it back to you so you're both on the same page. And again, that's easier to sense when you're co-located with somebody. And make sure people are comfortable with their objectives. Again, you can feel when you're saying to someone, this is what I'd like you to achieve in the next month or two months. And you can see, you can read the facial expression better. You can see their eyes when they're like, oh, whoa, I'm not comfortable with this. Um, so make sure when you're not stressing people out and you're giving people a things that they, yes, they, it might be a stretch goal, but they can achieve them. And as I mentioned earlier, do not fall to proximity bias and put higher value on the work carried out by someone you can see than someone that you cannot observe. And then how do we measure people's performance? Well, it's not hours at the desk. You know that the number of hours you sit at a desk or at a keyboard does not mean you are productive. And managers, for some reason, have had this sense of safety. They can see them, they're working, and they never have. 
And now we've got people working remotely. This is sort of blown up in their faces because you can't see where they are. Um, so leaders must learn how to measure performance across teams and stop measuring the wrong things. You know, most of our employees now are knowledge workers. They're not producing widgets. So you can't say, you know, Fred, you produced two widgets last week and this week you produced three. And next, well, next week, let's produce four and we can demonstrate productivity. These knowledge workers think for a living, they come up with ideas, they solve problems, they find improvements. And leaders need to be able to measure that performance and the value that those people deliver. And measurement needs to take place on a regular basis. Scrap the annual performance review. If that's the only feedback and conversation about performance an employee has, then get rid of it. Measure performance on a regular basis. Don't tell me six months down the line that my performance wasn't up to scratch. Or some things I did were really good and some things I did weren't so good. Because I've had no opportunity to act on that information. I've just had six months to not build on the good stuff and six months to embed the bad stuff. So feedback should be continual and often. So let's look at equity and inclusivity. Now there's a lot of talk about diversity, equity and inclusivity for some time now. Um, what we've done with the hybrid team is where in the past diversity, equity and inclusivity has um, been focused on you know, gender, race, religion, sexual orientation, uh, and, and many other things. We've now added two more elements to equity and inclusivity, those in the office and those not in the office. And you may have, I don't know, in your organisations, but I know I've worked in organisations in the past where working from home was frowned upon and was sort of called shirking from home. Oh, Mary's working from home today. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, thinking, you know, Mary was getting some time off, but classing it as working from home. But now we can't have that sort of discrimination as hybrid becomes the norm. So there's no room for, as I've mentioned, proximity bias, that um, employees will be better, will be more productive, more innovative, more collaborative, et cetera, in the office. That is a load of, yeah. we've had for the past 18 to months, two years, employees collaborating quite effectively, thank you, being more productive than they were in the office. So it doesn't, they don't have to be back in an office and you cannot have proximity bias for those that are. And it just will cre create cultural conflicts and us and them. So everybody needs to feel a sense of belonging and being part of the team, regardless of where they work. Everyone needs a sense of belonging and leaders need to lead with care and compassion, understand their employees, understand their situations and their challenges. And it might mean that you need to know team uh, members on a more personal level than you did before. And check in, how are they going? How are they feeling? Do, is there anything you, they need from you? Question I always ask is, what can I do for you? What do you need from me? Make sure everybody is involved in conversations, in meetings, everybody has a voice. Some people um, are quite prepared to say, I've got something to say. Other people like to be invited. So the leaders need to be doing this now, making sure that quiet people have their opportunity to contribute. And team building is going to be absolutely critical to keep bringing the team together in whatever way that might be. And it's different for every team um, to keep that connection going and check in with every team member on a regular basis. And as well as regular check ins, you know, drop in um, as you might have done when you're passing someone at the desk. You know, how's it going? Um, pick up the phone have a, 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 um, an ad hoc text um, or video meeting just to say, how are you going? 
Okay. And the last area I want to look at is optimised technology. Um, and the reason I want to look at this, and I've already touched on this slightly, is that there are still many let's say organizations or bosses of organizations, and this is made, happening a lot in the financial sector, who are mandating a total return to the office. Now, I think there's many reasons for that, which I don't have time to go into, but they are citing the lack of collaboration as a reason that everyone has to go back into the office and that it's going to have an adverse effect on culture. Culture isn't a place. Culture isn't a building. So that one's been blown out of the water as well. But in regard to collaboration, you know, we've all done the best we can with Zooms and Teams and Mural and Miro, but there really are some massive um, emerging technologies that are going to change the game. And these aren't just ideas, these are, these are really gonna be here very soon. So I just created this short three minute video um, from other sources. Some of you may have seen this before, but for many people I've shown this to, they're just like, Ugh. the first is Google Project Starline. It's like you're looking at a piece of glass and you, it's like the person's on the other side, three dimensional. So Google Project Starline. Microsoft Mesh, where you're allowing attendees who are physically present to work with people who are virtually connected at the same workspace. Microsoft Mesh. And the third one, Facebook Horizons workrooms. So let's watch, let's think on, and then you tell me if we're not gonna be able to collaborate across locations. So imagine instead of looking at a screen, you're looking at a magic pane of glass. Okay, and now? through that glass, you're seeing another person on the other side. Hi, can you see me? Say hi to Auntie. Oh my gosh, I love you. <laughs> so you look beautiful. And then you just start having a conversation, just like you would if you were physically together. Like, I feel like you're here. This is wild. I can see that curl in your hair. I can see how your sweater is falling. Yeah. <laughs> but then you'll be saying, put on a little lipstick, Maury. <laughs> there are really three breakthroughs coming together here. One is the ability to capture people as they are. The second is the ability to compress that information and send it over existing networks efficiently. And the third is the ability to render that person viewable through a three-dimensional display. So it really feels like you're talking with someone right in front of you. <laughs> Don't say goodbye. Don't go away. That was mind-blowing. I've seen a lot, but I've never seen this. I felt like she was present and I felt like I was present in that moment too. It was like she was here. Bye. We have two planes right now on the same trajectory. As we put people first, technology fades into the background and feels like anything but. Aisha, what do you think? I think if we head 330, maintaining 2800, we'll be clear for approach. Excellent. This changes the way we see the world and in turn, changes the world we see. These numbers are looking great, actually. There's promise in the possibilities. And what we see and create next will stretch the imagination. Good morning, Sarah. Morning. Slowly coming towards the thumb. A world without boundaries. Good job. A lot better than yesterday. Yeah. Excellent. Slowly bring the A world where technology enhances, not limits, humanity. with people front, center, and in the spotlight. The future is here, and here can be anywhere. Introducing Microsoft Mesh.
Okay. Um, I realise we've only got five minutes left. So this last slide I'm going to run through fairly quickly. It's a, a checklist um, that you can ask the question about your team or your organisations. Seven questions, yes or no. Um, sorry. So easy to keep track of your score, yes or no. So, and if you get a yes, that's a a, a finger, a, a number. So do all your leaders measure employee performance by outcomes and value, not hours? Yes or no? Do all of your leaders empower employees and then get out of the way, trusting them to do the right thing? Yes or no? Do all of your leaders lead with empathy and really understand the feelings and the reality of other people, yes or no? Do all your leaders run effective meetings, hybrid meetings, making sure everybody has a voice regardless of where they are, yes or no? Do all your leaders treat everyone as equal regardless of where they work, yes or no? Are all your leaders looking at the latest and greatest technology for communication and collaboration? Or are you still going to be limited to Teams and Zoom? Yes or no? And the final question, do all your leaders and every member of the team know the capabilities of everybody else in the team? Do you know the skills and capabilities of everybody else? So seven step checklist, if you scored five, brilliant. You're building leadership capability to lead the hybrid team. Scored three or four, you're getting there, but there's a way to go. And if you scored less than three, I recommend some immediate action as you're going to be put the organisation and the team at risk. Regardless of your score, improvements as easy as reaching out for help. So um, they're my details. Um, now I do have... Um, a couple of questions here. As you can see there, if you want to go to my website and order any of my books, put in the code hybrid to get 10% off. Um, Ankit said, had an attrition six months ago. This guy mentioned in one-on-ones that he was good and happy. Never mentioned or express any discomfort or stress, even when you probed. One day he flipped and exploded. What could I have done better? That's a very good question, Ankit, and a, and a, a big one as well. I would probably say, you know, if you've asked the questions and you've probed, um, probably nothing you could have done. I would suggest that the only thing the organisation could have done is make sure that that person knew there was lots of other avenues to get assistance from if he felt he needed it. You know, is there a stigma about mental health in the workplace that he didn't feel safe to, to um, share? Um, I don't think there's anything you could have done. Maybe something from an organisational level could have done that he could have gone. If he didn't feel safe sharing with you, not because of who you are, but just because organisationally there was a stigma, um, then other avenues. And Anonymous has said some companies have started working from the office. They thought the team culture was getting impacted. Is it true that team culture is impacted in the working from home setup? A short answer to that is... If, if people in your organisation, executives, managers, whatever, in your organisation, think culture is about the office, then that's a big problem. Culture is about um, values and relationships and beliefs. It's not about bricks and mortar. Um, and deep, so what could be done to make the team member feel comfortable when asked questions about their improvements instead of making them vulnerable? Um, and I'd, I'd like to take that one offline. I need to think about the question. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, we need to, yeah, when you're asking about people's performance, it's, um, you know, being compassionate and empathising and understanding their situation rather than, you know, making them feel that they, they failed. Have the conversation about setbacks, not failure. You know, setbacks are temporary. You can move on. But again, happy to, to take that. I know I've run out of time. <laughs> Thank you everyone for listening.